Welcome to The Shuv Show. I'm your host, Christine Jackman. Tonight's show, we'll discuss hindered prayers. Did you ever hear people claim this? God always hears your prayers? The insinuation here is that God will respond to you in the positive. But is that scriptural? Is that the truth? Let's put what we think aside and discover what God thinks. In the Bible, you will see that under certain circumstances, God can indeed turn his face away, refusing to hear your cries. Time to drosh and dig deeper into the scriptures. So when does God turn his face away? When someone persistently grumbles in disbelief to his promises, and when someone rebels against what God has commanded. In Devarim, Deuteronomy 1, we read the account of the Israelites complaining after receiving the evil report about the promised land from ten of the twelve spies. They wanted to pick a new leader and go back to Egypt. As divine punishment, they were commanded to return to the wilderness for forty years, and the grumblers would not enter the promised land. Only their children and faithful Joshua and Caleb would achieve that goal. But the whiners added to their transgression by ignoring that decree. Look at Devarim, Deuteronomy 1, verses 43 to 46a. Quote, So I spoke to you, but you would not listen. Instead, you rebelled against the command of Hashem, Yutevave, the name, and acted presumptuously and went up into the hill country. The Amorites who lived in that hill country came out against you and chased you as bees do and crushed you from Seir to Hormah. Then you returned and wept before Hashem, but Hashem did not listen to your voice nor give ear to you. End quote. When does God turn his face from you and ignore your cries? When you persist in sinning by departing from his ways. We need to learn a lesson from the holy prophets. First, what is the main job of a prophet? To tell the future? No, to call the people back to covenant faithfulness. That is the mark of a true prophet. There is only one God, and his ways are holy, just, and true. Listen to what Scripture says when we persist in sinful departure from obeying God's commandments. In Yeshayahu, Isaiah 57, I'll be reading verses 3 to 4, 13a and 17. You can hear the angry frustration and broken heart of the Lord. Quote, but come here, you sons of a sorceress, offspring of an adulterer and a prostitute. Against whom do you jest? Against whom do you open wide your mouth and stick out your tongue? Are you not children of rebellion, offspring of deceit? When you cry out, let your collection of idols deliver you. But the wind will carry all of them up, and a breath will take them away. Because of the iniquity of his unjust gain, I was angry and struck him, I hid my face and was angry, and he went on turning away in the way of his heart. End quote. Oh, and then look at Yeshiau, Isaiah 65. I'm going to be reading verses 2 through 4 and 11 and 12. Quote, I have spread up my hands all day long to a rebellious people who walk in the way which is not good, following their own thoughts, a people who continually provoke me to my face offering sacrifices in gardens and burning incense on bricks, who sit among the graves and spend the night in secret places, who eat pig's flesh, and the broth of unclean meat is in their pots. But you who forsake Hashem, who forget my holy mountain, who set a table for fortune, and who fill cups with mixed wine for destiny, I will destine you for the sword, and all of you will bow down to the slaughter, because I called but you did not answer. I spoke, but you did not hear, and you did evil in my sight and chose that in which I did not delight. End quote. Tehillim, Psalm 66, verse 18, quote, If I regard wickedness in my heart, Hashem will not hear. End quote. The word for wickedness there is aven, that is uh, the vanity or the futility of idol worship. Idol worship can happen without a statue. What is the essence of idol worship? Anything that pulls you off God's path, turns you away to the right or to the left and to the weeds, convinces you to disobey his laws and instructions. When you forsake his kingship, you become servant to yourself and or the adversary. And that realm leads to darkness and sorrow. If God says a thing in scripture, you better bet he means it. 
Yirmiyahu, Jeremiah 5, verses 19, 23 through 25, quote, And it will be when you say, Why does Hashem our Elohim do all these things to us? Then you shall answer them, Just as you have forsaken me and served foreign gods in your land, so you shall serve aliens in a land that is not yours. But these people have a defiant and rebellious heart. They have revolted and departed. They do not say in their heart, Let us now fear Hashem our Elohim, who gives rain both former and latter in its season. He reserves for us the appointed weeks of the harvest. Your iniquities have turned these things away, and your sins have withheld good from you. End quote. Another thing that can hinder prayers is this type of sin. Look at 1 Kepha, 1 Peter 3, verse 7. Quote, you husbands in the same way, live with your wives in an understanding way, as a weaker vessel, since she is a woman. Show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life, so that your prayers will not be hindered. End quote. And in Yohanan, John 5, we read the account of the man lying by the Bethesda pool, who had been unable to walk for 38 years. Messiah Yeshua finds him and asks the man if he wants to get well. The man complains that he has no one to help him get into the water when it's stirred. Verse 8, Then Yeshua said to him, Get up, pick up your mat and walk. At once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. Verse 14, Later Yeshua found him at the temple and said to him, See, you're well again. Stop sinning, or something worse may happen to you. End quote. From this verse, we see that sometimes bad things can happen as a result of sin in your life. Unrepentant sin can hinder your prayers and your healing. Then there's asking for the wrong reason. Look at Yaakov, James 4, verses 2 through 3. Quote, you lust and do not have, so you commit murder. You're envious and cannot attain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend it on your pleasures, end quote. So what kind of prayers does the Lord hear? One kind is, he hears the prayers of those who are his, those redeemed by Messiah's blood and walking in covenant faithfulness, and the prayers that are in accordance with his will. 1 Kepha, 1 Peter 3, verse 12, quote, For the eyes of the Lord are towards the righteous, and his ears attend to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil, end quote. Peter is quoting from the Tanakh, Genesis to Malachi. Tanakh means Torah, Nevi'im, Ketuvim, the Law, the Prophets, and the Writings. Can you guess from what book Peter is quoting? It's Psalms, Tehillim, Psalms 34, verses 15 and 16. Quote, The eyes of Hashem are towards the righteous, and his ears are open to their Shavah, cry for help. The face of Hashem is against evildoers to cut off the memory of them from the earth, end quote. Oh, and here's another great verse. First Yohanan, First John 5, verses 13 through 14, quote, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. This is the confidence which we have before him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request which we have asked from him, end quote. Do not miss the caveat here. Our prayers answered in the affirmative will be those requests that are made according to his will, not ours. It's according to his will and his timing. Another type of prayer that is heard is the prayers of a repentant heart. Look at Tehillim Psalms 51 verse 17. Note that David chooses to use the name of God, Elohim. Elohim has the connotation of a judge. David says, quote, The sacrifices of Elohim are a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, O Elohim, you will not despise. End quote. Please take the time to read the account of King Josiah in 2 Melachim, 2 Kings 22, who came to power in house of Judah at just eight years old. Scripture records in verse 2, Quote, he did right in the sight of Hashem and walked in all the way of his father David, nor did he turn aside to the right or to the left. End quote. In King Josiah's 18th year, during renovations of the Holy Temple, which had been long neglected by sinful kings, 
A startling find was made in the rubble. Hilkiah, the Kohen Gadol, the high priest, reverently placed in the hands of Shaphan, the scribe, a dusty scroll. It was the book of the law, the law of Moses, containing the terms of the ancient covenant. The scribe took it to King Josiah and read it to him. 2 Kings 22, starting with verse 11. When the king heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his clothes. End quote. Then the king commanded the men, verse 13, quote, Go inquire of Hashem for me and the people in all Judah concerning the words of this book that has been found. For great is the wrath of Hashem that burns against us because our fathers have not listened to the words of this book to do according to all that is written concerning us. End quote. So the gentlemen go to Huldah the prophetess to find out what the Lord will say. Huldah tells them, starting in verse 15, Quote, Thus says Hashem Elohim of Israel, Tell the man who sent you to me, Thus says Hashem, Behold, I bring evil on this place and on its inhabitants, even all the words of the book which the king of Judah has read, because they have forsaken me and have burned incense to other gods that they might provoke me to anger with all the work of their hands. Therefore my wrath burns against this place and it shall not be quenched. But to the king of Judah, who sent you to inquire of Hashem, thus shall you say to him, Thus says Hashem Elohim of Israel, regarding the words which you have heard, Because your heart was tender, and you humbled yourself before Hashem, when you heard what I spoke against this place and against its inhabitants, that they should become a desolation and a curse, and you have torn your clothes and wept before me. I truly have heard you declares Hashem. Therefore, behold, I will gather you to your fathers, and you will be gathered to your grave in peace, and your eyes will not see all the evil which I will bring on this place. End quote. Josiah is an example of true contrition, using not mere words, but righteous actions. His heartfelt sorrow secured a reprieve for Josiah and his nation from the coming devastating judgment which House of Judah had earned prior to his reign. Sadly, subsequent kings after Josiah undid all the good that he had done, and around 586-587 B.C., House of Judah fell and Jerusalem was sacked by the Babylonians. This historical testimony is a lesson for us today. God is waiting for us to dig the scroll out of the rubble, repent, and come back to covenant faithfulness, Messiah Yeshua and the written Torah. You cannot separate them. It's a covenant thing. Want to save your nation? Well, we need leadership and a people willing to rend their garments and their hearts and make the righteous change back to following God and his ways. Or else. Yes, the or else will surely come. Be a student of history and historical patterns. God says there is nothing new under the sun. Open your eyes, your heart, your mind. Seek him now, today. Perhaps there will be a reprieve. Sometimes God withdraws from us and goes quiet to test us. And sometimes God gives us a command to test us. Will we obey? There are a few different words in the biblical Hebrew for test, try, etc. that carry different flavors. Bachan, Nasa, and Saraf. The first one, bachan, is a primitive root to test, especially metals, generally and figuratively, to investigate, examine, prove, tempt, try. This is like, this is as metals are tested by fire. I'll give you an example. In Zechariah, Zechariah 13.9a, it says, quote, And I will bring the third part through the fire, refine them as silver is refined, and bachan, test them as gold is bachan tested, end quote. Then there's nasa, it's a primitive root also, to test, to try something out, to prove a thing. Is a thing or a person what they say they are? You know, sniff it out. Here's an example of that word from Shemot, Exodus 16, 4, quote, Then Hashem said to Moshe, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day, talking about the manna, 
that I may nasa them, test them, whether or not they will walk in my instructions. End quote. Then we also have saraf, another primitive root, meaning essentially to fuse, having to do like with metal, that is refine, cast, founder, goldsmith, melt, purge, purge away, try. This is the refiner's fire that purges away the dross until the best quality is attained. Here's an example of the word being used in Tehillim Psalms 12, verse 6, quote, The words of Hashem are pure words as silver, zaraf, tried in a furnace on the earth, refined seven times, end quote. In light of this, let's investigate Tehillim Psalms 26, verse 2, which contains all three of these Hebrew words. Let's read it first in English, then leave the shallow end of the pool and dive in deeper to look at key Hebrew words to gain a greater depth of nuance and understanding. Okay, so Tehillim Psalms 26, verse 2, quote, Examine me, Hashem, and try me. Test my mind and my heart, end quote. Now, the key Hebrew words are Bachan me, examine me, Hashem, and Nasa, try me. Tsaraf, test my mind. Kilia is the Hebrew word there, and that means emotions. And my heart, Lev, which means your mind and your thoughts. The psalmist is asking the Lord to go deep to examine him, like gold is handled for the purpose of refining. He wants him to try or prove him, nasah him, take the sniff test, what's in there. Then refine, zara, his emotions, the kilia, because feelings are not always truth. Truth is never based on feelings. So Lord, turn up the heat on the silver of feelings and burn off the emotions that are lies. Then also zaraf his mind, his thoughts, what he believes and ruminates on. Refine away the lies, fears, and false faith, leaving behind the purity and value of truth. And truth never fails. Truth is the steady foundation for faith and feelings. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth, Messiah Yeshua said. God has revealed his holy covenant lifestyle to those redeemed by the blood of Messiah Yeshua who paid for our way back into restored relationship with the Father and his ancient covenants. So sometimes God withdraws from us, goes quiet to test us. Sometimes he gives a command to test us. He showed this with um, Hezekiah in Second Chronicles 32, 31, quote, However, regarding the ambassadors of the prince of Babylon, whom they sent to him to inquire about the wonder that was done in the land, God withdrew from him. He withdrew from Hezekiah. Why? Quote, in order to test him that he might know all that is in his heart. End quote. Also, Shemot, Exodus 16, verses 4 and 5, 16 and 20. Quote, then Hashem said to Moshe, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day, that I may nasa, I may test them whether or not they will walk in my instruction. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather daily. Then dropping down to verse 16, this is what Hashem has commanded. Gather of it every man as much as he should eat. You shall take an omer apiece according to the number of persons each of you have in his tent. The sons of Israel did so, and some gathered much and some little. When they measured it with an omer, he who had gathered much had no excess, and he who had gathered little had no lack. Every man gathered as much as he should eat. And Moses said to him, Let no man leave any of it until morning. But they didn't listen to Moshe. And some left part until morning, and it bred worms and became foul. And Moses was angry with them. End quote. Yes, God is watching. He has given us his revealed written word. Will we obey, or will we continue to veer off to the right or the left, off his paths and into someone else's commands? Is this not what most of Christendom has done. They have left much of the Lord's commands and set up their own, just like Jeroboam, son of Nevat. But God is calling out today. Return, Teshuvah. Will you hear his voice and respond by action, or will you close your ears? 1 Corinthians 15, 34, quote, 
Awake to righteousness and do not sin. For some do not have the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. End quote. What is the scriptural definition of sin? Sin is lawlessness, breaking the terms of the covenant. If you have been born again, your sin has been atoned for by the blood of Messiah Yeshua, the innocent lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. If you have entered the mikvah, gone under the water defiled and rose up from it cleansed, your status is now changed. You've been baptized, mikvahed, into the name of the Lord Messiah Yeshua. You are his follower now, and you must imitate him. And Messiah Yeshua is the Word made flesh, the living Torah, the way, the truth, and the life. He walks in the ancient paths of covenant, veering neither to the right nor to the left. And he expects us to do the same. The Ruach HaKodesh writes the written Torah, the Holy Law, the terms of the ancient covenant, upon our hearts, just as it was prophesied in Jeremiah 31. The written Torah is the law of liberty. The Bible says so. Tehillim, Psalms 119, 44-45, quote, So I will keep your law, your Torah, continually, forever and ever, and I will walk at liberty, for I seek your precepts, end quote. If someone tells you that keeping the written Torah, the law of Moses, is a burden or largely obsolete, they are ignorant of Scripture and how ancient Near Eastern covenant functions. And they are oblivious to the unchanging holiness of the Creator. They do not have the knowledge of God. I don't mean to sound harsh, but this is just too important to mince words. God's truth cannot be maligned. These people are either not reading the entirety of the Bible and or their reading of it is colored by what bias or predetermined notion they have been immersed in all their lives. I understand. I was there with them for most of my life. I knew something was wrong. I just couldn't put my finger on it. Now I know. It's a covenant thing. And it's beautiful. And it's liberating. Look up. Seek him. Desperately cry to him from an honest heart. Lord, I want to know your truth. Deliver me from deception. This is a prayer request he will certainly hear. How do I know this? Because he heard my cry. And he's heard many others. Hear the cry of the heart of the Lord in Devarim, Deuteronomy 5, verse 29. Quote, Oh, that they had such a heart in them, that they would fear me and always keep all my commandments, that it might be well with them and their children forever. End quote. The Lord is doing a thing these days. An Elijah call is going out. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. A flowering, a first fruits of people whose minds and hearts and ears are being awakened to coming back to him, back to walking in the covenant faithful lifestyle of the redeemed community. The same one kept by the patriarchs, the Kedoshim, the holy ones, and the first Talmudim of Messiah Yeshua. Things went sideways after the destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans. Go study history. You'll see how things for believers, Jew and Gentile, got messed up, many leaving the pure faith. Remember Yeshua posited in Luke 18.8, quote, But when the Son of Man comes, will he find the faith on the earth? End quote. But finally, the thick fog of deception that has been obscuring the truth for so long is beginning to dissipate as the Ruach HaKodesh, the Spirit of Holiness, the Holy Spirit, breathes truth into those he has come to rescue. The true shepherd is seeking his lost sheep because the shepherds are not doing their jobs. Listen to Yechezkiel, Ezekiel 34, verses 10 through 12. The context, God is speaking to the nation of Israel, which includes grafted in Gentiles. Quote, Thus says Adonai Hashem, Behold, I am against the shepherds, and I will require my flock at their hands. I will cause them to cease feeding the sheep, and the shepherds shall feed themselves no more. For I will deliver my flock from their mouths, that they may no longer be food for them. For thus says Adonai Hashem, Indeed, I myself will search for my sheep and seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock on the day he is among his scattered sheep, so I will seek out my sheep and deliver them from all the places where they were scattered on a cloudy and dark day. End quote. It is true, the Lord himself is awakening people. 
It's exciting and possibly a precursor to the return of the Messiah. His eyes are looking throughout the earth for those he will awaken. In 2 Chronicles 16, 19, we learn this, quote, For the eyes of Hashem move to and fro throughout the earth that he may strongly support those whose heart is completely his, end quote. Wishy-washy obeisance to the Creator, treasuring traditions and rules of men more than the written commands of the Lord, and everyone doing what is right in their own eyes, is a culture that can only end in painful judgment from on high. God is long-suffering, but he does have a red line. Time may be shorter than we think. Pray for true revival, that people will repent, shuv, come back to the Lord and his holy ways. Lord, your kingdom come. You are our only true hope. Breathe genuine revival throughout our lands for the sake of your name. This has been the Shuv Show. I'm your host, Christine Jackman. Lila Tove, good night.